Greetings, everyone. If I could ask you to uh, assemble, take your seats. Uh, we'll start the last session of the symposium. I want to uh, greet uh, each one of you on behalf of the Howard University and Morehouse communities, on behalf of President uh, Franklin and Rebeau, and welcome you to the last session. Uh, which will be moderated and led by Professor David Wall Rice from Morehouse College. Uh, and I want to invite uh, Dr. Professor Rice and his colleagues and panelists to please, please come forward. Uh, as they do, I, I want to um, thank each one of you for participating in the morning session, which was focused on STEM and the scholarship uh, in science, technology, um, engineering, and mathematics, and the afternoon session, which was focused on the youth vote. Uh, after today's session tomorrow, please come back and join us for the great debate uh, starting at 1 o'clock in Crampton between Morehouse College and Howard University. And then please join us on Saturday for the game at RFK Stadium starting at 3 o'clock. So with that, I want to ask my colleague, Professor Rice, uh, to please come forward and lead us in this discussion. Good evening. Uh, my name is David Wall Rice. I'm an associate professor at Morehouse College in the Department of Psychology. Um, but I feel it's also very necessary to say that I am a bison by way of educational training. I received my PhD here in 2004 and actually just finished <coughs> teaching a class, personality psychology. So I'm very pleased to be here and I'm very excited about the turnout that we have today. Uh, now, of course, this discussion is one that's supposed to be casual, coffee and conversation, or chai tea, or whatever it is that you'd like. Somebody back, it was kind of somebody. <laughs> Thanks, Dr. Martin, I always kind of Dr. Martin. Uh, so it's a very casual conversation. Hopefully we'll have a good reporté between our panelists as well as among you all or the audience. But of course, we know that what it is that we're going to talk about today is something that's very serious talking about relationships between the sexes. Sex is so many times uh, those conversations can evolve into name calling or pointing fingers instead of really kind of circling around the, the, the fundamental base of love, right? Black love, uh, respect, relationships, right? And really looking at kind of the core essence of those words. So even though we're going to make sure that we're encouraging a frank discussion, we want to make sure that it's a discussion that remains, as I've said informally to some of my colleagues, on the rails, right? We want to make sure that we're respectful of differing opinions. We want to make sure that we think constructively and critically about what it is that we're uh, kind of dialoguing with here today. So with all those kind of really fun words, uh, I'll, I'll leave you with that. Now, now one thing that, that uh, we did do is we came up with some questions that we offered to the panelists, as, as well as to some, as, as well as to uh, you know, the our two, uh, our two moderators. So one of the things that I think I'll do now is just kind of read what those questions are, so that you can vibe on them for a little bit, and then we'll invite all the panelists to kind of come up. So it's going to take me a second, but I'm going to kind of uh, read them aloud, if that's okay. Is that, is that good? Everybody's okay? Okay, thank you. All right. So framing questions, that's what we call these, framing questions. What is the present state of black love and black health? Does black sex or lust trump black love? Uh, is black love different from other love? Uh, to what extent is popular culture contributing to and or compromising how we presently understand both romantic and platonic loving relationships? Where does the academy play in terms of developing and demonstrating affirming examples of black love? Where should we be looking for examples of healthy, loving, receptive relationships? Who are our black love role models? Is there a love playbook? And if so, who wrote it? For some reason, as I was writing that question, I heard my grandmother echoing in my ear, Jesus. Um, <laughs> what role do college-going students play in perpetuating positive examples of black love? Black love and respecting black women beyond objectification. Can you have one without the other? Same-sex romantic love. How can you get the dialogue in the seat of institutions like historically black colleges such as Morehouse and Howard 
that too often are crippled in their necessary leadership in this reality because of social hyper-conservatism. They really let me sneak that one in. Interracial black love, is there a problem with it? No, for real, is there a problem with it? Uh, does socioeconomic status define the type of black love you demonstrate or are capable of? Uh, is, it's often said that true love is work, and if so, are we, those folks who are occupants of the 21st century, are we equipped for that type of love, the type of love uh, that was hardcore and that sustained us through slavery, Jim Crow, civil rights? How is black love linked to liberating community from racialized and gender oppression? And finally, is Obama black love real, or is it fake like God's? Clever. That last one was clever, but it was more clever. <laughs> okay, so that's why I thought of the panel, or am I the moderator? Those are kind of framing questions. Again, thank you so much for uh, coming out. Um, I'll have some, I guess, closing remarks from now to the to our moderators. So thanks again. How's everybody doing? Yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah. Is this thing on? My name is Harold Fisher. I am the host of The Daily Drum on WHUR, Sirius XM Channel 141, part of the brand new Howard University Radio Network. Okay. This is my, my, my co-host here, Conjure Farrell. Author, good evening. Practitioner, all around good looking, good sister. <laughs> Thank you. She's going to help with this um, program. We are talking about black love and rewriting the black love playbook. We may, we may get to all of those comments or questions. We may not because I suspect that when we're talking about black love, particularly when we, we talk about some of the things that may be wrong with how we interact with each other in loving context or not so loving context, sometimes we may get stuck, but Conjured is here to help me move it along. Yes, I am, and I will. Okay, absolutely. Yes. She's gonna stay in my stuff, and I appreciate that. And so, with that said, I want to uh, begin to uh, first tell you a little bit about Conjit. She is a strategic life and relationship coach and author. She specializes in individual and couples counseling. So if you got a problem, you can call her at 3 a.m. Okay? No, you can't. But you, <laughs> you're, you have an hourly rate, right? I, yeah, but you know, boundaries, mm -hmm. yeah, 10 o'clock, and I'm old. I go to bed at 10, so. <laughs> but she yeah. has published numerous articles on mental health with her research interests foc focusing on uh, Jungian analysis, pragmatic transitions, biological anthropology, evolutionary psychology, conflict resolution, feminist psychology, or philosophy, I should say, gender, queer theory, and human sexuality. So you can definitely tell us what's wrong with us. <laughs> Where do we start? Yeah, absolutely. Um, we need to hold up a mirror to start, and I think we're going to do that today. I hope you guys are open-minded and ready to uh, get into some honest self-reflection and exploration. I think it'll be fun. I think it absolutely will be fun. Okay, and now I'd like to introduce, let me, let me pull this a little closer. I'd like to introduce some of the other panelists that we have today. Christopher Darren Cathcart is a published author. Please come on up here, Christopher. Published author. Give, give him a hand. Public relations marketing and brand development expert. He's a public speaker and uh, he has more than 25 years of experience in public relations. He is highly respected in the advocacy and social service communities where he tirelessly promotes issues such as AIDS awareness as well as mentorships for at risk youth. Camila Woodson. Camille Woodson is the director of training, a licensed clinical psychologist, and an associate presser here at the Howard University School of Education's Department of Human Development 
and Psychoeducational Studies Counseling Psychology PhD program. She is also an adjunct professor at the Chicago School of Professional Psychology here in Washington, D.C. Welcome, welcome. Pierre and Jamila Benu. Pierre and Jamila Benu are the husband and wife. You can applaud for them. Yes, they're coming on up right now. They're the husband and wife owners of Oyen Handmade, an all natural body and hair care product line. The Benus were also named Ebony Magazine's coolest black family in America. And so they're here today to shed some of their knowledge and wisdom in that area. Alduan Tart is a positive psychologist, professional speaker, media personality, and parenting teen relationship expert, as well as a devoted father. Currently, he co-hosts TV One's relationship healing show, Love Addiction. And last, but most certainly not least, is Mr. Lamon Rucker. You can welcome him. You probably recognize him. He is an artist, an educator, activist, and an entrepreneur. He was born in Pittsburgh, grew up right here in Washington, D.C. He is the handsome star of the new and highly anticipated film, The Under Shepherd, and is widely known for the smash hit sitcom, Tyler Perry's Meet the Browns. He may also be recognized as Mona's long-awaited beau, Chase, on UPN's Half and Half, as well as his bad boy characters in the daytime dramas, As the World Turns, and All My Children. Let's give our panelists a hand. I encourage, we are gonna be taking questions um, before the end of the evening, and so I certainly encourage uh, our panelists uh, to, to be candid, or as I say on the Daily Drum, tell the truth and shame the devil. Okay, uh, this is real talk for a very serious, critical issue. This is not just a woman's issue. This is a couple's issue. This is a single's issue. This is a married issue. It's a young person's issue. It is social, uh, 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 a senior's issue. We're dealing with all forms of love and trying to get at least an idea of where we can, where we are, and where we can move from here. And. As we come to the end of the program, I guess probably within the last half hour or so, we will take questions. Um, so uh, with that, uh, I will start with that first question. I'm going to direct this to um, Christopher. What is the present state of black love, and how do we know? I was hoping this was annoying, so I wouldn't have to answer that, actually. <laughs> um, really quick, I'm also a Howard University graduate. Right. I'm from Plainfield, New Jersey. I was Houston president many, many moons ago. They still have those, right? All right. All right. And uh, I'm very, very uh, happy to be back here. The funny thing, when I was at Howard, I remember going to a lot of seminars on many subjects. But it seemed like the one about relationships seemed to always pull more people. And I think that's been the case. Uh, as we speak here today. The state of black love? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If I had an answer to that that made sense, I would be a well-paid world traveler solving everybody's problems. Mm. The state of the community relative to black love, I like to speak on that. I'm here as an AIDS activist, HIV AIDS awareness. Everybody aware of the HIV status? Yes. Raise your hand. If anybody on the panel asks you a question, raise your hand as if they were gonna give you $100 if you raise it the highest. They won't, but raise your hand as if they were, all right? I, it's hard to really wrap your head around that question about the state of black love because love is defined in so many different ways. Uh, we're talking about romantic love, we're talking about family love, love of friend. I think the black community in a whole is strong, but I think our community in terms of our, our family relationships need to be strong. I think we still divide over issues of sexuality, income inequality, educational differences. I think we have to develop the means to have better dialogue within our community. I am an African American, I am a straight black man, I am not HIV positive, but I'm an AIDS activist. 
And those things usually aren't strung together because there's disharmony in our community about the different roles we all can play. That level of disharmony does not stop at the doorsteps of sexually transmitted diseases or other issues. They find their way into the bedroom in terms of how do we deal with each other as male and female. I remember when I was here at Howard, um, one of the big issues you had as a black man on campus was defining your own sense of masculinity. And at that time, most of us defined our sense, and I also played on the football team two years, so add that to the mix of what I'm saying. Our issues of masculinity were almost always defined by the level of sexual conquest. Yes? Yes. All right. So do you think those things stop when you graduate? <laughs> when you get out into the world, I moved to Brooklyn when I left Howard. I'm, I'm coming to the point. I moved to Brooklyn when I left Howard, and I carried on that same concept of how I define myself as a man through sexual conquest, through various relationships. So let me ask you, because the question was, I'm, I'm coming around the corner. Come on now. Come on. What, what, what is the state? I, the, inter the, the, the internal conflict within our individual selves is never ending. And we take those into our relationships. So the state of black families and relationships are strong, but they're still conflicted. We still do not talk enough about things that impact us as individuals and as a unit. And we have to increase the level of dialogue. So I will say, I believe that the state of the black love situation is strong, but it has to be strong if we're going to be successful in all these other levels outside of the bedroom. Camila, what do you think about that? <laughs> I see you writing notes, so I want to get into what your notes are about. Yeah, I put you on the spot. Yes, you did. But let me say, um, my idea, I was thinking that in terms of black love, we could be in a state of, of peril, if you will, but it isn't because we don't have the capacity. I would argue that um, we have difficulty finding uh, mates who are in the same place at the same time that we are. And so for many uh, couples, or, or if you think about the ways in which we come together, uh, many heterosexual women will find Mr. Right. And so they've targeted a gentleman and decide he is the one that I'm going to be with. But males who are heterosexual tend to target miss right now, literally right now while we're together and things could change tomorrow. And so <laughs> I think that we have competing expectations. And so we don't always come together with the same goals at the same time. Um, I also, I agree with that and I think that's absolutely true. And I wanna go back to the, the definition of love. I mean, because on one hand, it's subjective, right? Anyone can say what love means to them. But from a biological perspective, love is a chemical process called limerence that lasts for a period of time and then it changes. So if you don't understand the biology and the biological processes behind love, you might make some mistakes. You might mistake chemistry and lust for platonic compatible love. And you really kind of have to know the difference between them, you know, and have a real clear understanding on what the many faces of love are before you can kind of move forward into a, uh, a healthy relationship and how you pick, right? But I, I need to challenge that because, and I'll ask Pierre about this, did you understand the biology and the chemistry of love when you met your wife? Um, hello, one, two. Uh, I did not. Speak I, I did not, I did not. I mean, was that a consideration um, or were you looking at that wonderful hairstyle that she had, those wonderful, beautiful teeth? You know, well, her I statuesque mean, fi fi figure that, and her wonderful voice. But, that was part of it, I, I assume. But I mean, when we met, I wasn't thinking chemistry or science. But were you physically attracted to her? Well, that's part of it. Of well, course. yes. Okay, so there is a but, part but, for that. But there's the intellect, there's sure. the mind. There's, you know what I mean? Like, we met, and I was, to tell you the truth, as far as relationships are concerned, I was done. When we met, we were both at a point where we were like, finished. I don't want to deal with you. You don't want to deal with me. Oh, I'm sorry. We didn't want to deal with each other. We were just like, hey, you're fun. I'm fun. Let's hang out. And it was just a hangout session for the first maybe six months. We just had fun. You know what I mean? We weren't, cons like, we had done the love relationship thing, and it just didn't work out as it was, as it's presently structured. And I think the issue, uh, more than anything, is that oftentimes as it's presented to us, love is... Uh, 
It's very corporate. It's very, uh, it's what we see on TV. We learned love from the Cosby show and we learned love from, you know, all in the family. We know to give flowers. We know all these gestures, but we're just parroting things that we've seen. Very, well, we don't bring our own imagination to love. We don't define it for ourselves. So then we don't have any idea what we want. We just parrot what we've seen and then expect these results. And I really feel that for love to flourish and for you to know what love is, you have to know what it is initially for yourself and move forward from there. Aldewan, would you agree with that? I agree with both, both points. I think what uh, Kanjit was trying to say is that sometimes we confuse infatuation with love because when you meet, and it's the same thing when you uh, first get married, there is a period in which you are really physiologically high off of one another. And when things start to wear off, you think that there's no more chemistry in the relationship when in reality you just move into the second phase of a relationship. So you have to understand that. And I think that where women tend to get in trouble with that and men get in trouble is that when you start dating, you have this infatuation, but you don't date the guy long enough for him to have an That's actual right. emotional connection to you. Right. We'll tell you anything and we'll believe it because we're high off of how good you look and the fun that we have, but it doesn't really mean that we're friends or that we are spiritually connected. And if you don't date us long enough uh, to get to know that, you can find yourself uh, getting played. So I think both ends of the continuum uh, are true. Yeah, and that's why you have to know a little bit more about male psychobiology, because when you do, you understand, oh, this is how male processes go. They fall in love, it lasts for this extended period of time, and there's a range in that. And if you know more about the human male and how he processes information and how he thinks, and the human female, you put yourself in a better position to have the kind of relationship that you want. It, are you, um, can Go I ahead. Jump yeah. In at yeah. <laughs> are or, you or, and maybe I should hear from your wife. Yeah, the, I, we, uh, oh, because I, I'd be interested in, you know, since she allowed you to speak first. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and I emphasize allow yes. you to speak first. So uh, my, the question is about the state of black love, but my question specifically to him. You know, because we've heard from the single folk, but you know, let's hear from you know the married married folk from the wife's position. You know, you have a beautiful child, and and you know, and apparently you you all are. He's you know, for rent. <laughs> and what? Neutral color goes a long time more. Absolutely. So you know, from your perspective, as a married wife with a you know great smile and all of her teeth. <laughs> you know, what is the state of black love? Um, I think that the, the state of black love is a million different things. It's something different for me than it is for every single person on this panel and every single person in this audience. Um, because ideally, the state of black love is a thing that's experienced by black people being in a state of love. Um, and since we are all individuals and all have differences in our persons and our personalities, it would be different for each of us and it would be perfect for each of us. That's the ideal. Um, <laughs> um, I also think that the state of black love culturally or socio-culturally is one that's in um, an almost constant condition of being attacked um, in popular culture or in popular conversation. Um, excuse me. We're, <laughs> um, even as individuals go about living their loving black lives, um, we are constantly presented with this um, public black pathology um, of one of um, just the, the conversation about, oh, black women are wrong in X, Y, Z reason, and that's why we can't get married, as though millions of black women aren't married. You know, and just like a constant erasure of our actual experience as lived in favor of the conversation about how wrong we are. And it's been going on since, you know, Moynihan and, and since far before that. Just it's more interesting to talk about what's wrong with us in this arena as well as in many others than it is to talk about how we're actually living. I want to move on to the next question and we're going to start with Lamont for this one since he is a, uh, a sex symbol and uh, <laughs> you all are laughing, but some of you all have already asked me about him. So. <laughs> Let, let, let's, let's keep it real. Does black sex trump black love? Mm. Let me help you here. <laughs> well, 
but let me say they're both wonderful. Um, but uh, I think there also needs to be um, the understanding that at times there is a clear distinction between the two. Uh, and I think somebody, uh, and I apologize for not being able to identify exactly who said it earlier, but uh, the, the, the timing you know, dynamic I think is, is very important. I think, even to go back to the first question a little bit, the state of black love, I, I look at it, don't misunderstand me stating this the way I'm gonna state it, it's gonna sound negative, but I look at negative things as an opportunity of hope and an opportunity for growth and, you know, uh, and, and resurrection, if you will. But I think the state of black love is in trouble. Um, I think we uh, yearn for intimacy, but we're in fear so much of, of subjugation, you know? I think we've gotten our young women to the point where the word submit or serve, you might as well, you know, tell a woman you're about to cut her head off. You know, she cannot wrap her head around being willing to submit to a man. Then it's, it's a foreign language. Um, similarly, trying to get a brother to understand how we as well should be and can be and should be open to and willing to serve and uh, look for and desire this true intimacy that goes beyond just these physical needs is something that we're like, nah, dog, I ain't even really trying to hear that. I'm trying to get my man and keep it moving. I got other things to do. I ain't trying to really deal with her. There's, look at, I mean, even in this room, there's, it's majorly women. I'm supposed to focus on one of y'all? And I'm gonna be here for four years? Yeah, right, wrong mm -hmm. time. You got bad timing. So, but at the same time, that's not to say that you meet a young lady at this particular time in your life, freshman, sophomore, junior, senior, graduate school, whatever, that you might not really identify something really special about her and special in her that you want to have her around for a while. That might not also mean you don't want to be physically, you know, intimate with her, but that doesn't necessarily mean you love her yet. It also doesn't mean that you can't and won't love her eventually. So again, it's that patience with how long can we get the opportunity to know each other before we can figure out if our definitions of love, our goals in life, what we need from each other, the love that we have for ourselves, which has everything to do with what we're capable of giving to anybody else, if those things are gonna be compatible, if they're gonna fall in line, if they're gonna have not just a short-term chemistry, but a long-term opportunity for growth and doing all kind of wonderful things together. So, sex and love, trust me, there's no better sex than when you're in love with somebody. Let me explain that to you, first of all. Um, so y'all think y'all doing something now, y'all don't know nothing. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> you would looking back, I remember I thought I was the man when I was 18, 19, 20. <laughs> man, whatever. Y'all, please, if I knew then what I know now, I'm, trust me, it's on a whole nother level when you are really, really into somebody. When the connection goes beyond just her, uh, her physical you know, shape or you know, how, you, how you make each other feel physically. So love is definitely connected to sex. I don't think there's, I think we're spiritual beings and sexual beings innately just as, as human. Those, there's an intimacy between those two things that you can't get away from. And eventually, when those two things are working together, it's on a whole nother level. But I think there needs to be an understanding uh, for men and women, young women and young men, that uh, just because there is sex doesn't mean there's love. Lamont, and, uh, Lamont, before you go on, I don't want you to get too far away from something you stated that I wanted to ask you about. And then I'm going to ask Camila something about this, too. You said, how long can we give each other? before we jump into these right. other things. What do you mean when you say, how long can we give each other? Does that mean, how long can we delay sex? In some situations, yeah. I think we, um, we a couple people mentioned friendship and uh, you know, they talked about how they just hung out and got to know each other and enjoyed one another's company. There's, there's, an, there's a very interesting dynamic. You're often more giving to somebody you're not obligated to. And we lose that. Real intimacy, um, again, isn't, it doesn't even have to be physical. People are often closer to friends than they are to people that they're having sex with. 
So we get to the sexual relationship before there's actually any friendship. So I think if you have the opportunity, the best way to approach it, and I also think there's significantly less risk in a sense, at least you're not putting your body, you know, in the conversation yet, um, is that you focus on being friends, you focus on being, and with friends there's obligation too. I mean, to be a good friend, you know, you got to do your part, right, and invest in the relationship too. Okay. But if you do that, and if you're giving, hold on, let me. I'm almost there. I'm no, around, on, coming around the corner. I, I, I if you're, if you're, if if, right. if you focus on giving your friend what they need, and that person is truly loving enough to give you what you need as a friend, you're going to go significantly further than just jumping right into sharing your bodies with each other. You're going to go. You're going to go further along that way. So yeah, you should wait. You you know you can wait. But everybody doesn't wait. And I think we get ourselves in a lot of trouble when we don't wait. I also know that I'll wait with the girl that I really, really like, but I'm still going to be having sex with somebody else over here. You so, know? No, so it's why true. do you... Wait, wait. So why do I you... I mean, let's keep it... We're keeping it real, right? Well, I, I, so why well, do you I, I, divide? I'm waiting for you to We're keeping it real. Okay. Yeah. I, okay. Let, let us deal with the... Because I'm building a relationship right here, but, you know, I'm handling my business in the meantime. Let now, it, eventually... Uh -huh. Eventually, y'all want to be oh y'all don't want to be honest about this. That, that, this that, is a BS conversation, or are we keeping it real? I'm letting you. I'm letting you know. Most likely, if he's not sleeping with you, most likely he's sleeping with someone else. And isn't it true that if I mean, she I, won't, someone else yes. will? Yes. However, that doesn't mean you need to sleep with him to keep him. We need to redefine Maintain your standards. And, take your time. And when we're ready for you, trust me, we're probably doing you a favor. So learn to take it as we a compliment. To you want us to treat you like a little hoe, like we might be treating somebody else? What's real. Oh, is that okay, what you okay, want? Okay. You. Pierre, no, I'm just saying. I'm talk, this is how we talk when y'all ain't around. Yeah, Pierre had something right? to say about yeah, masculinity. Can Pierre. Can we please bring Pierre Wait, in here? I'll, Come on, Pierre. This is how we, we talk when y'all ain't around. We need to redefine, number one, I respect your opinion, brother. Um, but I don't talk like that when you're not around necessarily. Uh, we need well, to redefine. We need to redefine what's <laughs> not no, all wait. The time. We need to redefine what's real. We need to talk about emotional maturity. We need to talk about risk. What That's is risk? Are you and, it, and is it risk if it's an investment? What are you, what are we trying to get? What is the goal? What are we trying to achieve? A relationship or sex or exactly. momentary moment of pleasure. Those are two different things and we cannot also negate that women want those things too. It's a, right. it's yeah. a thing wanted from both sides. But if we're talking about real relationships, there's gonna be, there has to be a, 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 a level of maturity on both sides. And I'm sorry, I'm gonna let my wife speak. It, because it sounds like maybe there's a disconnect between masculinity and humanity. Does maybe something like that? Well, yeah, there's a big there's difference a between being male and being a man. You know, those are different things. <laughs> you know, well, your masculine nature, as he's saying, is not as necessarily mature as the evolution that it takes to become a man. When that's you're a right. man, there's a, that's, that's different than your primitive needs as a male. Okay, hold on. Hold, hold I think on. there's also something to be defined about, are we talking about dating and dating strategies, or are we talking about relationships? Because I think there are some, you know, there's some schools of dating thought that say you should never be exclusive until you have a commitment and then no one men or women should you know date exclusively until they've reached you know a, an accord together about what they're both going to commit to um uh, wow really <laughs> <laughs> um and then definitely i think that that was an excellent point about the disconnect between masculinity and, and humanity I, I think that there's um kind of a cultural drag of masculinity that's been, um, that's, that's performed by, in, and, and again, in a certain element of like kind of pop culture and right. maybe the kind of coon show that hip hop has become, like it's, it's like this high over the top <laughs> performance of a particular kind of inhuman, no. misogynist, um, <laughs> invulnerability. Right. that is masquerading as kind of the only acceptable way to express black manhood. As though fatherhood is not also black manhood, as though partnership is not also black manhood and hasn't always been, as though scholarship and, you know, musicianship is not also black manhood. But those, those kinds of expressions are, are suppressed in favor of, 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 of things like 
um, the first brother who spoke, I'm sorry, I think he's, he said that the masculinity being um, being ex expressed or in terms of conquest. If I may, mm -hmm. if, if, if I may, um, as I said in the beginning, I, I really wanted, can you all hear me? Okay, because my microphone seems a little low. How many women in this room want to be married? Raise your hand. I said women. Why are you talking? I said how many women want to be married? Raise your hand. The mic. Okay, so, and we have women in, in this room who probably range in age from 18 to you really don't need to know what my age is. <laughs> and so my question goes back, Alzwan, you can, you can address this. Why is it that women of various ages are having such a difficult time with men finding husbands? Because and, and, and let me let me dig down a little bit deeper. I understand about you know masculinity versus humanity and all of those other things, but you know I don't deal with foolishness when we're talking about answering questions on my show. Do you love me? Do you want to be with me? If not, tell me why. How many folks want to know the answer to that question when you're dealing with these people, men or women? Don't you want to know? Don't you want somebody to be authentic? Okay. <laughs> I think that partnership needs better press. I beg your pardon? I think partnership needs better press. Maybe it does. But, and, and the question that I want you, and I would love to have your husband answer too, but I want, I, I'm going to get to Aldemar. The other question is, what made you want to get married? Because that's the question that a lot of women want to know. But Aldemar, go first. Okay. Well, well, we should know that marriage benefits men more than it benefits women. So that's something that you need to know. Married men are happier, healthier, and wealthier. That is a fact. And, and you're right. Uh, the benefits of marriage are not well documented in the media. You'll think that most men prefer to be single. But when a man, I think especially after he hits 30, 35, most men don't prefer to be single. They are looking to get coupled or they are dating you know, out of fear or not to get hurt. But I think, I think one... The, re the reality is all women are not created equal when it comes to your wife potential. You, you, have right. to, you have to understand that there's a big difference between being a girlfriend and being a wife. And if you don't know how to be a wife as far as what a man looks for in a wife, then you will date incorrectly your entire life. Meanwhile, you'll look across and you'll see that your, your friend has gotten married, divorced, remarried, divorced, and remarried again before you've gotten married even once. And it's because she understands men. Same thing with men understanding women. One thing that I think is interesting in, in trying to go back to the sex and love comment is that men are both. We're both moral at the same time we have sex drives. That's reality. Even the pastor has a sex drive. So you have to understand, this, there's a little acronym um, that's documented. These are the four things that men need, okay? It's called STAR. We need you to be our star. And I documented, I'm never ashamed for shameless plugging in my book, The Ring Formula, How to Be the Only One He'll Ever Need. Get your hustle on, brother. Anytime, Go ahead. anytime. We'll keep it. I'm a, one is sexual energy. Men are attracted to your sexual energy. That's a fact. So when you come right out on the first date and say that you're celibate, and I'm a Christian, you are killing the sex drive. He's not going to call back. Let him figure that out later. So one, sexual energy. Two, touch. You need to understand that men need two to three times the amount of physical touch in order to feel loved. See, women talk to connect while we need to feel connected in order to talk. Yeah. You come and Says who? This is, Biology. This is, this is a... Yeah, this is according to Dr. Patricia Love, who's recognized as a just, national I, expert. I and, just want to know and, where you get your and how many men? From. How many men do you know love baby let's talk? We don't want to hear baby let's talk because that means let's talk about why you're inadequate or why you're not meeting my needs. If you want to show me that you love me, touch me. And so there are women that know that. 
They're touching on your biceps. They're touching on your shoulders. And what do moms do to sons? They touch. If, if you're a parent right now, if you're not hugging your son, sons need five to six, six times the amount of physical touch in order to feel love. How many boys do you know you try and talk to them and all they do? We don't want to hear talk. We want touch. Uh, a, accept that you give meaning to our lives. Don't tell us what we're doing wrong. That's the worst thing you can do. Guide us as to how to make you happy. Realize that we live to make you happy. We live to look in your eyes and for you to say, you know what, my man makes sure I don't worry about anything. My man's the best in the world. When we come home, you look at us because we're providers. And then R, you're going to have to respect our routines. Biologically, we're creatures of, of, of routine. Don't try and change the routine, just try and join in with it. So what men are looking for, my opinion, is a star. How many out there are ready to be stars? That's right. Raise that hand. Here, uh, go ahead, and then I want to I want to bring wow. Pierre back. I, I, I want to be really quick because um, uh, I am married, so I understand some of the dynamics. I have looked at the sex and love kind of differently the way it's been expressed. I'm talking about when I was at Howard because nothing can be discussed out of context, and I want to discuss within the context of where you are. When I was at school, I didn't look at love and sex even being on the same highway. Sex was something I wanted in a visceral way. Love was something I assumed would happen all by itself at some time. We're led to believe through our movies and our novels and our films that love is this beautiful thing and the stars align and things happen and rainbows pop out and that's the person. Sex, Mugabo, you just go after it, right? That's what you want. But here's the deal. To men, I'm going to talk to the brothers in here. You can't really love someone if you don't respect them. And if you're lying to someone to have sex with them, you do not respect them. Bravery, physical bravery, the willingness to fight someone who stepped on your shoe or disrespected your woman at a party, that is an animal instinct. I read this quote the other day, I dug it. That is a visceral animal instinct. Moral courage, moral courage is a much higher call. And sometimes within the context of where you are in school, you have to fight the trend if you really want to respect the system. I'm not even talking about loving the system. I'm talking about respecting her enough to care about her enough to be honest with her about what you're doing, who you're sleeping with, what your sexual history has been, do you know your status, do you want to sleep with her and other people, what are your intentions? And women, moral courage is not a one-way street. I always, I, I have said, the brothers up here may attest, if the women really had higher standards in terms of we won't let you get away with this, we would have changed our game. Yes. We only did what we knew we can get away with. So in terms of the moral color, before we get to the love thing, about being morally courageous and being respectful to the people that you want to lay down with, because the thing about love is this, sex ain't only better. Everything you do with someone you're in love with is better. Watching the movies, walking to the park, studying. Everything goes up notches. Bringing it back down to sex, you still need, absent of love, respect, and consideration. Mm -hmm. Pierre, the, the question I asked before, uh, and you are obviously not of undergraduate college age. However, and, 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 I, and, I, and I say that in all seriousness, mm -hmm. but when you answer that, please keep, keep in mind, why did you want to get married? Um, I honestly, uh, you know, I, I feel like what, when we got married, it was kind of a continuation of what we already had. So really, really, when we got married, it wasn't a big deal. It wasn't like, ooh, we're going to get married. It was like, we've been together. We got married in, I think, less than a year, right? So it was like less than a year, and we were like, this is it. I'm good. You good? And we, but why? I mean, if, if it was good, why walk down the aisle? Why not just keep it the way it was? Why take the step? Um, I guess taxes. I mean, <laughs> it's really, it wasn't a... <laughs> No, look, I'm, you were talking about keeping it real. Do you want me to hit him, or do, are you going to hit him? Right. Okay. Oh, okay. <laughs> that was the reason. Really? Okay. Yeah. It really... It was, a, it was almost we, like a, um, a, a... It was just a piece of paper. Oh, wait. We had already committed. It was already there. It was just... We, we thought it would make our families feel better about the fact that we were living together. <laughs> um, we thought that it would be interesting 
an interesting challenge to kind of reclaim the institution. Like both of our parents um, were divorced. It, we didn't have a lot of like marriage is the answer kind of feelings. We were we were very we were not much older than undergraduate people. I was 22. He was 24. Okay. We were like having a good time. We were committed. We were living together. We were like let's. Okay, isn't that how you make it official? Let's make well, it official. I and it, it, I felt we also, I'm sorry. That's okay. I felt we also had an opportunity in what we had to redefine or define for ourselves what marriage is. We're living in a time right now where, you know, we're not trading uh, a wife for six goats or, you know what I mean? It's not like, a, we, we're living in a very amazing time where all of us, all these women in here who raise their hands about marriage have the opportunity to define it for themselves. You know what I mean? It's not, it's not within a particular... I think that something else that's very important um, and that females can sometimes think is that it's not important. It's very important to have a man get down on his knee and propose to you and offer half of what he has to you. It's his ego, putting his ego down to submit that part of himself to you. That's very, very important because if a man doesn't make a sacrifice and see you as something valuable and something worth sacrificing for, then he's not. He's not going to appreciate you. He's going to keep right on going. So it's very, very important that you hold a standard if you want, if you want a man to be with you and love you long term. One of the biggest mistakes that I found I went through as a student was I followed feminist ideology, which said woman first, woman power, woman, woman, woman. And then next thing I know, I get into a relationship and I'm this powerful woman and men weren't interested. You don't need me. And I was like, what's this? And then I start to realize, oh, wait a minute. Oh, I'm a female. My breasts produce milk that nurture. So part of who I am is a nurturer. And as I begin to step into a more feminine role and realizing that a man is my partner and not my enemy, wow. Wow, relationships just opened up. I never learned to cook. I had to learn that. My fiance loves it. Why didn't they tell me that? Can I, can I add oh, one thing? Oh, Lord, have mercy. <laughs> That's funny. I mean, here's, here's, here's a, a non-clinical answer, but I think it's real. We, we marry you because, first of all, we don't want another man to marry you. Okay, that's, that's one thing. Say that again. I'm sorry. We marry you because we don't want another man to marry you. And then, two, because you're the one. What's, what's hard for, I think, a lot of people to comprehend is that, like I said, all women are not created equal. You don't date equally. And when you have that one woman that, that fits you like a rib, that one woman that really knows what she's doing, see, above loving you, are needing you, she gets you. The number one complaint that I hear from men is that women don't get them, don't care to get them. They want to take, or they want a good fit, or you're getting 35 and 38, and he's good enough. But that's because you have sex with him before he figures out who you are. And men have this like shut off mechanism. Whereas if you have sex with them too early, they're like, eh. I fulfilled my biological destiny. You accepted my sperm. Okay, next, what's going on? He never takes the time to understand who you are. And if you delay sex, you give the man more time to get to know you on a human level. I made my fiance wait three and a half months before he even got anywhere near this. And you know what? He cherishes it. He cherishes our relationship. It's not a female thing. That's how male animals Function. Stop. <laughs> if he wants saying. the cookie, he will wait until he gets it, even if he does not want you. Exactly. He won't. He he will wait three and a half months. If you if you if you appeal to him physically, if he likes the way you, you can make him wait. But you know. People say that men have no patience. If they want you, body or soul, and body and soul, they will wait. But if they just want you, because as, as you know, uh, you know, uh, Brother Rucker said earlier, you know, they, if they're not having sex with you while they're waiting for you, they may be having sex with someone else. And I didn't do that. I didn't do that. I waited. 
But here's 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 the thing. I'm being and, real. And, now hold and, on. And wait, I'm wait, not, wait, and I'm not wait, that wait. That's hold not on. Possible. I, I'm gonna ruin it. No, I'm not no, saying. No, 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 not at all. But, but you did have to but give me you sexual have to be energy. open to the possibility that something like that yeah, could you, be happening. There, here's the reality: is that I was open to waiting based on your confidence level. So if you said, "Hey, if you need to go ahead and be with other women, go ahead and do that. Go ahead and do that. Go knock yourself out. Imply that I'm not going to be here, and I don't have to. See, what was implied in that is that what you won't wait for, there are about another hundred men that will. But at the same time, she had to have sexual energy. I had to know if I wait, ooh, wait, oh my goodness. It's, it's, going, it's going to be nice. I, I, I'm going to be transparent. I'm, I'm talking about in college, definitely. So there had to be energy because I'm attracted to energy. So if I know that you have, and here's the hypocrisy of, of men. We want you to be sexy and fine and classy at the same time. So if you can master both of those for me to know she has morals, and at the same time we know that you are, uh, what's the word I'm looking for, exciting and open and, and, and know that I'll be taken care of, why would I go anywhere else? So I think that a lot of men, there's two, there's two poles that you have to manage. You have to be sexy and appeal to his physical nature. And at the same time, he has to be able to take you home to mom. I agree with that 100%. I think you Absolutely. have to be yourself. But, and I think well, you, women are sexy. So well, are men. No, be yourself. But there's a process. Know yourself. It's not just about a, being yourself, though, because there are things you have to do in order to set up a foundation for a healthy relationship. If you want I, to lose weight, you cut back on fats and you exercise more, and it's a part of a process. Being yourself changes based on whatever your objective is. So if your objective is a healthy and harmonious relationship with a man, you have to change some of who you are in order to get that goal. I had to change some of that feminist programming because I wanted a healthy relationship with but a wait man. A I don't think feminism is Wait, wait, wait. wait. But why can't... Feminism why, is but not was, was that feminism part of, of who you were? A relationship. Hold not on. Wait, wait, wait a minute, Jamila. Hold on. Hold on. No. I think it's, a, it's about balance. I mean, we want a strong wait, wait woman. Wait a minute. Hold I, on. I've never been intimidated hold, hold, by hold, a strong hold. woman. Hold on. Because I need to address something that she said. Because, you, because we spoke about changing ourselves. Okay? Now, if I heard correctly, you spoke about you had to change this in order for, your, for you to be compatible and to be acceptable. But was what you changed part of who you were? It was a part of me that I was okay with letting go. Okay, because that is important. You do not, and I don't think there's anybody here who would disagree with this. If I am who I am and I like you, why must I change who I am because I like you? Exactly. Because There's if you want a healthy res a re relationship, the preservation of the system of the relationship is more important than your individual expression. You that have is a true. System. Now, is it, now, but is right? that, the now, ideal okay, is now, to now, find great. a healthy relationship now, here's that, a question. Can, that you can be your, within which you can be yourself. Right. You have now, to now, how, now, let me ask the audience. Let me ask the audience this: How many women in the audience? And this is direct. This is and, and women have said this. You know for. Moses part of the Red Sea that you don't want to settle. You don't want to settle. You don't want to settle. So my question is, and this is and this is for and this is for uh, 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 Jamila, and, and it's really important. How fine is the line between settling and compromise? Because what she said, because she's, oh, and you know what? Thank you. Please, because you you've been a little quiet, and I'm, I I want to make sure we bring you into this. And I think that is important because it sounds to me. As if, as if uh, Conjit made a compromise. You didn't change just because you liked him. You didn't do anything to settle, but you made a compromise, which is different from settling. Uh, Camila, first, please. Uh, well, what I was thinking is that um, a large part of what seeming to be missing from our conversation is talking about a divine or a spiritual kind of connection to someone. And that the idea is when it's right, 
or when it's, it's not built out of lust and it's not built out of material things and issues, when it's right, you don't have to do a lot of change. Are you talking about soulmates? Well, I'm talking about being able to connect with someone in a way that th there's an essence, there's a connection, there's a realness, there's a spiritualness that you cannot manufacture. So it could be in, in another sister situation different from the sister right here, maybe if you learn how to cook, it still doesn't matter. So I think oftentimes when you talk about compromising or making concessions, when, whenever you have to say, well, I'm going to uh, deny parts of myself or act like it doesn't, uh, things don't matter, or when you're dealing with a male that this is just good enough, you can settle for this, then that means right there it's not right. And you perhaps need to wait and get to know people like uh, Al Dewan was saying or like Lamont was saying, get to know someone, and once you do, you don't have to do all that compromising because either it works or it doesn't, but you won't have uh, given up so much of yourself, your time, brothers, your money and energy when it wasn't going to work in the first place. But I don't think it's about giving up that essential part of yourself, but what about if you're a bitch? What if you have a bad attitude and you're negative? You do need to change those things if you want to have a healthy relationship with But you need to... But I'm saying, when I say um, the idea about giving up parts of yourself, I mean your physical self. <laughs> If you are doing a dance with no pants, right, right, right. with somebody that you don't know, with the idea of it going further, then you, you are giving up something. So my suggestion is that you, oh my, my you want my mic? You're good. My, oh, my suggestion <laughs> is that you take some time to really get in touch with what it is that attracts you about that person anyway, and having some sense of self about you when you approach it. So when you hear, uh, if you won't, she will, then you'll care enough about yourself like Aldewan said, and go ahead and handle your business. Right. You, I feel like if you, if, you, if, you, if you wear masks, you're gonna attract people that wear masks. I agree. And who are and, attracted and, to the mask. And who are attracted to the mask. Be yourself, know yourself. Some people like sex, some women, some men. Some people want a relationship all kinds of variations on how a relationship can work are out there if you search. And the one who wins is the one who looks. It, it's not, I think the language of like how we talk about relationships has to change. It's about attaining and getting and this is my man and this is my woman. And we're like giving up and get this. And like, it's an, like it's an exchange or a battle and mm -hmm. someone has to lose in order for someone else to win. Where right. if we're on the same team, we, we, gotta, we all want the same thing. Yeah. Ultimately. Right. So I it's agree not, it's with not that, a sacrifice but... if it's if it's for happiness. It's not like right. well, you know, it's not it's not it's settling just the higher you is a we. Isn't there isn't there a space though that can be said that you don't say or do anything that you feel like saying or doing no. in no. order to consider the other individual? No. That's so if you're that's, you know that's... you can be a considerate person. There you go. Okay. okay. I just wanted to make sure that that was mentioned. Your... But you can also be a considerate person. And you could be a can I just uh, but but I before we go, know, before we before we have another comment, I want to invite people to come to the microphone uh, during this last uh, 25 minutes or so. Uh, so you're more than welcome. Can I, can I just say also? I have one more thing want. too. Uh, go ahead. I, I just wanted to address this, a couple of things. The three month waiting for sex thing. Right? We all focus back on the three month waiting for sex. When I was at Howard, if I went three months, it's because I couldn't find anyone to have sex with. I mean, honestly, it, I'm trying to be real. It wasn't about... That's what I was saying. It, it, what, what did Chris Rock say? We are as faithful as our options. That was <laughs> one of his stand-ups. I'm not endorsing that. I'm trying to talk to you in context that when I was That's here. Because right. we could talk way over here, but I want you to be better than I was when I was here. Because I didn't have the moral fortitude that I want you to have. So if I liked someone and they didn't have sex with me, I was still trying to have sex with people. And I still may have liked them. You understand those two concepts can coexist. Yes. Right? You can actually love someone and want to be with them and have sex with someone else. Now I want to just really quick the compromise part. In all things in life, you negotiate. How many of you got roommates? Raise your hand, the high thing again, remember? <laughs> How many of you get to do exactly what you want in your room whenever you want to do it, regardless of what your roommate thinks? <laughs> And you need your own place. You, you have best friends. You, <laughs> you if you're a female, you have a best female friend that you make compromises with. Brothers, you make compromises. In all relationships, Everything is negotiated. you just have to set some things that are non-negotiable. Mm -hmm. 
And you have to establish for yourself now, which a lot of women when I was at Howard did not establish, what are the things that are non-negotiable? And you stand on those things. But after that, we all kind of find where we fit. Let's uh, go to the microphone. Uh, keep your questions um, brief, please. You've got a pad. <laughs> we can hear you if you speak up. We're talking about black love again, but is there a problem with black love or is there a problem with white love too? But what we're watching in the media is only showing us negative news of black love. If you look at TV, all we see are these negative images of ourselves on the TV portraying things this way. So we look at shows like James One, Love and Hip Hop, Scott Stevens, all the society, but we have an uh, African American woman that's executive producer, so she can't display ourselves in a good light. Then who can? <laughs> well, this is, I mean, there's so many layers to that statement and question, but you're absolutely right. We have to take uh, full responsibility for the, uh, not just our own patterns. And uh, my man over here talked about, you know, emotional maturity. Um, you know, my statements earlier were about the reality of the level of emotional maturity I was at when I was your age and in this place. And even once you graduate, you're still at a place where you haven't quite evolved to where you're having some of the more, you know, complex and layered, mature concepts of, of relationships. Similarly, we've got people on television who think they understand what power and opportunity to do great things are, but they're still adults, but you see how emotionally immature they still are. You see the dysfunction in their relationships you see how they not only are ruining their own relationships, but they've ruined their show, the job, all the people that were employed on the show that they were on that they now lost because they got in a fight or, you know, who knows what happened. You know, I'm probably talking about three or four relationships y'all have heard of over the last couple of years. So if we don't take some responsibility for the images that we put out there, unfortunately, and, and in particular, even with Facebook and Twitter and Instagram and all these social media mechanisms, most people are simply showing off. They don't have any class, any discretion, any real maturity about what information and even what images of themselves that they're putting out there. Most people want attention. They're not actually doing or creating a quality product that's supposed to uplift and enlighten and educate other people. You know why? You know why? Because that doesn't sell advertising. All right, all television is about, y'all, it ain't about educating anybody. It's about getting enough people in front of the television so that advertisers can sell their products to you. That's who pays for the shows. So, if we don't want this trash on TV, stop watching it. All right? Yeah. It's a two-way conversation. Similarly, similarly, when there is good TV on, we need to have a very active engagement withholding the networks and the producers and these production companies and actors accountable and support them. Hey, we love this show. We want to see more of this type of thing. We love Lamont Rucker. The work that he does is excellent. You guys should put him in more of your things. We like the way he represents, the, you know, whatever it is. But there's got to be a dialogue. We've got to be accountable as viewers. And we have to hold people accountable as the people who are creating these shows and these products for what they're putting out there. I'm embarrassed. I'm embarrassed as hell half the time, walking around knowing that we're out there looking at where we were acting. I mean, we're on all these shows, in particular a lot of reality shows, but guess what? Reality shows are cheap to make. They're non-union actors. People want attention. You all know that that's your opportunity to dumb down after whatever hard day of school or work or whatever. And even though you know it's your guilty you know, pleasure, you still watch it. We're still condoning this behavior. We've got to take some responsibility for it. I, I need to take another question, but I d yeah, please do. I was on a team that helped put this family together, so I, I just want to say we do really need to remember the age of the A lot of what we're talking about is doing material, and we've got 20 years on you. You know what I mean? But I'm saying. Some of us. I 
I think this is a you guys should embrace the fact that this is an incredible time in your life. Trust me, I had a ball, not just because I'm male and the ratios were 11 to 1, but what I learned about myself, what I was capable of, the high level conversation that you know we're having because people got all these degrees and stuff yeah those were things and ways that i tried to challenge myself at somewhat at that age but at the same time i also accepted myself where i was so i was trying to talk to y'all right where you are which is keeping it real about what the college experience is really like so we're telling you if you're going to date you know not that you shouldn't set high standards for yourselves i think you should but also understand that you might be asking somebody to do something they're not really capable of doing yet so instead, enjoy your youth, have fun, get to know yourselves, get to know each other. Do it safely, know your status, protect yourselves. I'm not condoning sex. I'm saying if you can be abstinent and wait, I absolutely encourage that. However, if you're not, this is the opportunity for you to practice your, some relationship skills, all right? Start putting them into practice so when you've matured to a point where you can actually have one that's actually gonna stand some test of time, You've actually got some experiences to work from, good and bad, that are going to build your character, build your skill set, and make you a better person who's going to, at right, some Lamont, point, be in a sustainable relationship. I've got to get some more questions in, uh, because I want to make sure that these, these sisters have a chance to speak. So I, I would encourage anyone who addresses any of these questions to keep your responses short. Passionate. <laughs> But short. Go ahead, sister. I'm sorry, but I have a question for him. Um, no, 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 you can talk to him if you want. All you, right. you I'll truncate it as best I can. You I'm made trying a to have comment a that it was about patience and how long you can get to know another person, right? But then after that, you said, but I'm going to have a girl that I'm building a relationship with, but then I'm going to be having sex on the side. Now, how does, to me, that contradicts that first statement, in my opinion, because how can you commit your full attention to building a relationship? and then also be having sex with mad people. Well, that's part of it. I'm not giving her my full attention yet. So that's my whole point. That doesn't mean I don't really like her though, but that doesn't mean I've even got enough confidence in her that I'm willing to give her my full attention yet. You gotta earn my attention just like I gotta earn yours. So I say that not to sound brutal, but to keep it real in a sense to say we're dating. And until we're at a point where we're gonna be exclusive, and we've got to communicate and be honest about it. And I believe it should be a two-way street. We should be able to both date, see other people. And when we're at a place where we're no longer comfortable with that, we need to talk about it and keep it real and be honest. So I, the other until thing I'm ready to give you my full and undivided attention, I need to be honest with you about the fact that I'm still seeing other people. Now, I might really okay, start, well, right. I might no, really no, start no, feeling you. I'm almost there. We gotta have, we're having a real conversation. I, want I might really be too, into you so. and I might eventually actually have an interest in being monogamous with you. So it still, again, may take me a little bit of time to say, all right, I need to stop seeing her. I need to cut this cord over here. She and I are cool, but you know what? I'm gonna just keep that in the friend zone. I'm really digging her. And at some point I'll be like, you know what? I'm ready to be your man. I want you to be my girl or whatever. At some point, you got to step up or step off. And if I don't want to do that, I got to be real with you and say, you know what? I'm not really trying to do, you know, that kind of thing. Right, I'm Camilla, still doing my thing. Camilla, please, please address. Okay. The other thing, the thing that you said, sister, that really stood out was you said, how is it when you're trying to build a relationship with this woman and he is not trying to build a relationship right. with you? trying to get to know you because you might just be a friend. And so the, the thing that I would say to you young ladies is that kisses are not contracts. Or even if you have sex with a guy, doesn't mean that he wants a relationship with you. And, or that the intention will ever be that. That's right. So you all need to keep in mind that just because you're dating doesn't mean that anything is going to come from it. And that what he's suggesting is that you be free to, to meet people and go out and have a good time, but understanding that they don't, are not committed to you and don't really owe you anything. So it's important to, regardless of what they say. Well, and we, that's the other piece, because some will not be honest about that. There are some good guys. I have to speak up. Y'all act like we don't catch feelings for you all as well. Is that I, I'm not saying that I didn't want to have sex with other women. You know, want to have sex with other women every day. That's every man, but you don't do it. I like my girlfriend that much that I didn't want to cheat on her. First of all, she wasn't going to tolerate it. Second of all, I wanted to be with her 
while I was on dates with other people while I was dating to try and figure out who I wanted to be with, all I thought about was her. So don't make it seem like all men want is sex. And we're sexual creatures. But at the same time, when you are emotionally connected to a woman, men go all in. Sometimes when we get hurt, we will resist letting our feelings get to that point because we don't want to be hurt again. So what I want you to understand, I think the, the, the silver lining is make sure that when, one, when you're dating, I think that you should have a rotation, ladies. A lot of you do laser vision and you focus on one guy. He's dating six women, six women and you're dating one man. No, open it up until he asks you to be exclusive. And then when he asks you to be exclusive, I think that's when you can start going towards sex. But don't act like men don't catch feelings and only want to be with you because it's all we think about. All right, sister, go ahead. Please try to keep your answers short, brothers, <laughs> so that we can get you know these, these two questions. And go ahead. OK, well, so far, everybody has been talking about like the relationship between love and sex. And I just want to know what anyone thought on like casual sex or like what, what happens if you don't, first of all, how do you know if you know yourself and if you don't, can you still have sex or is that just not acceptable? <laughs> yes. You, you, what, answer, at, you said, let me make sure I understand. Even if you know yourself, can you still have sex or do you mean No, because everybody has been saying like, oh, know yourself, but I thought we, we didn't know ourselves I, and that's why we're at college. To her which, which really goes back. Her question is, what if you don't know yourself? And if you don't, is it still okay to have sex? It's okay. No, but casual wait. sex. At that. Casual sex. Well, who, and, uh, well here's my, this, uh, I, this, I guess, here, here's the question. Who defines what is okay? Or casual. Right. It's, it, it's yeah, who, 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 can, who can define what is okay? I mean, you. Cas the, casual sex meaning without the love part. Well, let me say this. My mama told me a long time ago, you don't lay with a man unless you are okay with him being in your life for the rest of your life. So this is well before you, before HIV was an issue. But at this point, sure, you can have casual sex. You have urges, but you need to protect yourself. But understanding, is it really worth it? You have some curiosity or you're feeling amorous or whatever, but is it worth having a child or perhaps contracting an STI, or even HIV. So Camilla, no. She's not, no. What? That's no, I mean, she's I mean, at. like, she's in not your talking, head. No, let, no let, like, let, let, let us assume. I mean, in your head, like, I don't, I know that you can get pregnant or, like, contract the disease, but I mean, like, mentally and emotionally, how do you feel about, I don't know, 18, 19, 20-year-olds just? That's the question. Yeah, this, this, this isn't, yeah, I, I, I don't, so, let, let me say, Oh, th yeah. that she, this isn't about, this isn't about, is he going to be oh. in your life? This isn't, okay, a, okay. this isn't about, yes, you are going to protect yourself. So yeah. here's yeah. what you should know as a female yeah, animal. Your attachment process is different than male animals. You have a higher risks when you get pregnant. It's, so here's, here's what you should know as a female animal. If you have sex frequently, you have a higher chance of STDs. There is a higher likelihood that if you have sex and you get attached by this chemical called vasopressin and you break up, you'll become more cynical about relationships as you go down the line. Men aren't the same. Men aren't the same. They don't attach the same way. So the emotional consequences of casual sex for men are much lower than they are for women. So as a woman, you have to be very careful because the consequences are much higher for casual sex. And Pierre, let's, let's, wait a minute, wait a minute. Yeah, Pierre. I just, I, I, there's, there's so much, uh, there's so little time and so much to say. To your point, to your point specifically, you're young, and I say this to all of you, and I thank you so much for bringing it into perspective, because I was just like, well, the ethereal, whatever, whatever, and I was like, oh, wait, these are 19, 20, I didn't, all right. So, do you. Do you. You have to discover yourself. Have fun. I wrote this down because I was going to talk. Um, okay. Have fun. Be honest. Be absolutely honest with yourself. There are no secrets. When you're dating or having fun or trying to figure it out, be honest with yourself and what you like and what you want, but also be honest with the other person. Communication, even at this level, 1920, you got to be honest with what you want. And, um, and only you can decide what's okay for you. 
I quit saying. But quit. No. to that point, can I just say to that it's, <laughs> it's very, <laughs> can I just say this last thing? I, I, have, fi I have five minutes. I, I want to get this other okay, system Okay, I'm sorry. Come on. Okay, so I'm just curious. What is your opinion on the double standard between males and females? How males can go out there and basically have sex and it's okay. It's like dap it up, like everything's cool. But then when a female does the same thing, then we're looked at as hoes. It's, um, well, that goes into the misogyny of the culture. You know what I mean? It's, it's, it's not fair. It is not balanced. And um, I think also men have a different uh, level of emo like The way we're groomed societally, we have a different, we don't communicate. We're not groomed to communicate in the same way that women are. Women are taught to nurture, and you have dolls. Boys aren't taught to play with dolls necessarily. We're kind of taught to be aggressive, assert ourselves. Women have to be taught to assert themselves in a different way. So when, it's, when it comes to the coming together of man and woman, it gets, it gets muddy, and the expectations of a woman are different from that of a man. Males and females are different, different. Dense. The consequences of you having casual sex and a lot of sex are different than the male's consequences on your body, on your body. And this is every female. It's different. So men's biological role has to do with, I'm just talking about men as animals. They have more sperm. We only have one egg per month. Right, so theirs is much more about distributing sperm. Ours is about protecting our eggs, all right? Making sure we make choices that, are, that will preserve our children, that are good for our eggs. But wait, so, she's not, wait a minute. So what I'm saying is the difference is biologically based. I'm, I'm going to co I'm gonna wait, I, no, I'm wait, gonna have to jump in. I'm going to have to co-sign. She's not asking about protecting her eggs. She's talking about her reputation. But they're connected. They're connected. Be but men, but men, they're on, connected. men on college campuses aren't asking yes, they about are. how your eggs because are Because it's unconscious. No, it's unconscious. They but marry the women that protect their eggs. They marry the women that are strategic about sex. That's Men right. marry women who are intelligent female animals. So it's not all up in the air. This is right on the ground. I, Kanji's right. I mean, you, don't, you, may not, you may not want it, but here's what happens. Here's what happens. When you have casual sex, any type of sex, and the sex is good, and you're able to make your partner climax, when a man climaxes, it produces a chemical called vasopressin. When a woman climaxes, it, 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 it produces a chemical called oxytocin, which is called the cuddling hormone. So here's what it does, and here's how you get caught up. You have great sex. You, make each other, you bring each other to orgasm, and you think you like each other more than you really do. And then you continue to do this and continue to do this, and then you find yourself, oh, this is not so casual. I'm having some feelings for him, or he's having some feelings for me. And then it pops off, and it becomes so emotional, and then you start having emotional problems because you thought the connection was there, and now you feel played on both, on both halves, not understanding that when you came together and you decided to have sex, outside of love, you mimicked. You mimicked the emotion, which was not real, and what you created was a biological infatuation. It's the number one reason why divorces happen is because when the infatuation wears Excuse off, me. they I'll think do, that the on. relationship stop, is over. Stop. I'm done. We are not answering these, pe these young people's questions. Can I, can She's talking I, about a culturally that, expressed. No, 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 stop. Wait a minute. No, no, no. Bias. You, it, it's more so like, for example, when a, when she a asked man about double standards. Double standards no, I, has nothing to do with I, your can I, can I just Can I just add a sentence? She's talking the double about... standard is wrong. It is also decades old. You have to set a standard for yourself. What she's talking I mean, about, what she's talking men, about is... Po popular culture glorifies men who conquest a lot of women, while at the same time, we glorify a woman who keeps to herself. That concept is not compatible because who are these men sleeping she's, with other than women? I, she's talking about the double standard, men and women. She's trying to talk about women expressing themselves sexually and the, the imbalance on how that's looked upon by society. Being Why respected. Can't, but but and, not and even that, though. Like, even when a male oh. loses his virginity, like, it's looked at as well. But say, say I, I'm still a virgin and say I lose my virginity for the first time to somebody that I've dated for a year. The male can take that and go and make that look 
like a bad thing when really I, I thought I was in love and I thought I felt a connection that he didn't. So then it's just kind of looked at as bad because of what he said about it when really I wasn't going around here doing anything. You feel me? Like, that's kind of what I mean. So. <laughs> exactly. So, and so, and, and, I, and I think you, you, you hit on it. This, this is an age old issue that oh. happens. And I think that, you know, unfortunately, particularly when you're talking, you know, about, you know, about college. And, and, and I, I remember when I was in college and I, and I wrote a poem that, that simply said, the only, the, the, the only difference between a virgin and a hoe is what you know what she is doing. If you don't know, if you, if you don't know what she's doing, if he's keeping his interaction with you, if he respects you, whether he's had sex with you once or 20 times, but he keeps his mouth shut, your relationship is intact. Okay, and that's why I said that ain't got nothing to do with age. That has to do with the character of the person that you were dealing with. Choose wisely. Okay. Go ahead. It may be, it may have a biological basis, but she's asking about the cultural expression, and that's that's what her question is about. You know, uh, that, that's, um, that's I'm about interested how in relate. the science. Go ahead. I'm a nerd. Go ahead. I like science, okay. but that's ahead, not what she's asking. Um, I want to know your opinion about long I, distant relationships and temptations. <laughs> And okay. is that it? <laughs> <laughs> no, all right, number all right, here we go. No, number one reason, you're talking about your temptation or temptation on the part of the man or both? Both. All right, number one reason, does anyone know the number one reason why men and women cheat? Where is he? All right. Michigan. Michigan. All right, yeah. physical attraction is good. Here, that is partially right. The number one reason why men and women cheat, marriage, non-marriage, college, no college, doesn't matter, is opportunity. Opportunity, access, and desirability. So if you look good and you're around people that look good and you're away from your partner for significant periods of time, the chance of you cheating increase. That is the number one reason. So here's a quick advice for you. One, you all are going to have to find an end time to be in the same city. Two, you're going to have to have some physical contact to where you all can be with each other because those that connect have a strong relationship. Those of you that think that you have issues because of this or that, it's not the issue. It's the lack of connection that breaks relationships apart. So make sure that you have an end date as to when you're going to be in the same city and find some way to see one another and talk about those temptations when they come up. What, what you don't talk about, it's still there. Does that make sense? So talk about you listening, you're listening, you're riding with me. So just... Listen, if you have a temptation, tell him. He's not going to like it, but it's going to help y'all to be able to talk about it. Does that make sense? It, it, it kind of has to do with the last question, but I was just curious. You were saying, like, um, women should um, open their view and, like, date other people, but I just, for me, I'm worried about my reputation, so that's what I think about when I don't want to do that because, what? have sex with everybody. <laughs> let, let her ask her, at least. Okay, let her, so that let her was just my question. question. I feel, but I feel like he was saying that men do, so <laughs> It sounds like, and if this, if, and again, I'm not trying to be intrusive, but if we can, again, have some intimacy in here and be open about the fact that if you're in a long distance relationship and you're at a place where you're starting to feel like there's temptation or there is some strain on the relationship, you need to be honest about that. You should talk about that. You know, I actually have, oddly enough, I have a godson and a younger cousin that l like each other and have been dating. And I think it's the most incredible thing in the world, right? Because they're two people that I love and I've had a lot to do with who they are. However, I'm like, all right, now y'all be careful. Don't get caught up in this too soon. You're young. But if this is a wonderful thing, Roll with it. Let it grow. Let it evolve. See where it, it takes you. At the same time, if there starts to be things that happen in your lives that are starting to take you in different places, physically, geographically, whatever, other opportunity, you might, it might be in your best interest to step away from it. And that's okay. You can still be great friends. You'll actually maybe have the opportunity to develop that relationship in a whole nother way that doesn't involve the romantic layer of it. And then you never know. Time comes back, timing, I mean, timing, you know, represents itself, and you can revisit the dating conversation again. I definitely had people who have been just friends, and she's just been a good friend for a while, 
And then at another time, somewhere further in your lives, you're like, hey, you know what? Now that we're in the same city or this, this, and that, or you know what? If you're willing to make sure that we don't go any more than 10 days without seeing each other, we might actually be able to make this work regardless of how far away it is. But I got to be real about how often I need to see you, how often my physical needs need to be met, how much I miss you. I just need to be touched by you. I need to have you close to me. Again, believe it or not, when we really start needing to express ourselves to, we like to talk, you know, maybe not as much, maybe not about what happened at work today or what the conversation we had with our girlfriends, but there are ways, again, we need to connect with you. So be honest about what you can honestly manage right now, what you can really do, and if it's something that you need to move on from, don't be afraid to move on, all right? You're just going to get yourself in bigger trouble if you latch on to something that you're not really going to be able to maintain a really firm, you know, commitment to. And him too. You might need to set him free. Do your thing. Yeah. He'll come back if he's, when he's ready for you. Go good, ahead. Good evening. Um, my name is Rachel. I'm a senior African American studies major from Chicago, Illinois. And my question is kind of geared towards, we talk about a lot of, or the person who introduced this entire topic talked about the other things that we're going to cover, and I wanted to know uh, from all or one or a few of you how you feel about the increase of interracial marriage and interracial rela relationships, mainly upon the male, uh, uh, you know, uh, by male African American males. Camilla, <laughs> I was like, I'm going to answer that. Okay. I think at this point, who you fall in love with is who you fall in love with. I think um, now. I know that, you know, it has implications for our ideals about black love and uh, the black family. But if you, if you find someone that loves you, there's a divine or spiritual connection. They, they're treating you right. It, you, you meld well. You, you're good friends. Then I say go for it. Anyone else? Well, similarly, I think we've got to accept the fact that when, you know, it was maybe not too long ago for some, but we're no longer in kind of this small town community mechanism where, you know, Josie May and John John live right down the road from each other. Their parents have known each other and their grandparents have known each other. We've known each other since we were in grade school and then we start courting when we're teenagers and we marry at 17 and we don't go beyond that little small town. That dynamic has significantly changed. Now, there's certain things about that that I think we should try to maintain but this is a global marketplace now. You can date somebody you've never even seen, but you've got access through all this technology and so forth and so on. All the integration and the immigration that has you know, always been a dynamic of this country. We've got access to so many more people, and this is male and female. There are plenty of women marrying outside of their race you know, as well. So I think it's something that we should be open to and that we should embrace, but what I want to really deal with is the fact that for some people it might be a very deliberate choice because they've got some very negative issues about themselves, about their race, their people, the women or the men, you know, within their culture. And sometimes, yeah, they are looking outside of their own race, their own community, because they've got some negative feelings or even inferiority complexes. I know guys that are sharp guys, intelligent, but you know what? The real issue is they don't think that they're actually good enough for a black woman, so they'd rather go somewhere else where there's less work to do, they can probably get more of their needs met, and they're actually more so being a, maybe in a bigger position of power in that relationship because they're afraid a black woman might be a little bit too much work, too much competition, or she may not actually love and accept him because he doesn't feel like he's really bringing enough to the table according to her standards. I've heard a lot of different things when it comes into this, but some of these are part of the dynamic. But if we can understand that we all, even us, we got to compete with all the other men all across the planet now. We don't just have y'all to ourselves. You know, you all unfortunately have to accept the same thing. And we need to accept the fact that people are going to connect regardless of where they come from. And we shouldn't necessarily, you know, shun people or look down on them just because they're holding somebody else's hand that doesn't look just like them. Uh, last question. On the interracial marriage topic, um, do you have any ideas on why it's so stigmatized in the black community? Like, for example, like, why, why do black women freak out every time Reggie Bush dates a white chick? 
or like something like that happens? Like, why does it have to be such a big deal? Because I think there's a history in African American culture with slavery and things like that, and us black men and women experiencing trauma and seeing each other go through this trauma. And sometimes people feel like, oh, you're leaving me. You're leaving the race. You're turning your back on us. That's how some people feel about it. Um, and, and there's some validity to that. I would say that's a big thing, why it might be a big thing in our community. You know, it's sometimes people don't want to look in the face of a black person. They want, if I look in your face, it might remind me of my responsibility or the trauma. So I want to look in the face of somebody else. I need a break from being black. Some people look at it that way. These are just a few ideas. Those are a few that I know in my practice. We're also taught that the things that don't look like us are exotic, yeah. right? So everybody always kind of looks outside of who they are, the people that, you know, oh, I know her. She, she looked like, you know, the girl I grew up with or the girl across the street or she looked like my sister. And instead, I want to date a woman that doesn't look anything like anything I've ever experienced. And there's something really, you know, new and exotic and adventurous about that. And there's a lot of fantasy that goes in, into that. I think that, you know, that's part of it. But you also deal with, especially from you guys' perspective, the fact that women already outnumber men. Then on top of that, when you start dealing with the black community, you start talking about how many of us are not necessarily uh, high achieving, how many of us have not even graduated from high school, how many of us may be, you know, uh, right, gay, bisexual, transgender, whatever else, how many black men are incarcerated, how many men and how many, you know, black men die to, you know, whatever other kind of foolishness. You all are dealing with a significantly lower number of us, of us to begin with. So then on top of that, you're going to lose one of us to, right, <laughs> to, you know, an Asian woman or to, you know, whatever. Yeah, there's, there's a, definitely a sensitivity to that that's very, very significant. But, and I understand it. You but know, there, I understand there's, there's it. one thing that, that, that has been missed, particularly in your question, in the Reggie Bush example, uh, there are people, you know, taste notwithstanding, that Reggie Bush and the Lamon Ruckers and O.J. Simpson when he was playing football <laughs> and, and, and everybody, that these are high-achieving African-American men. I'm not talking about you specifically, brother, because I don't know who you're taking. No, no, but I'm you, understand, you get no, what I'm I know, saying. I, I was teasing you about the association with those two, but I know right, but, I, I had but, a feeling that's where you going. But what I'm saying <laughs> is, you know, if, if you see a... Lamont Rucker, and you say, oh, he's a good-looking brother, and, you know, he's a working actor, and he's articulate, and he has all of these wonderful <laughs> things, and he said, golly, I would love to have an opportunity to date him, and then you see him with the white woman, and you go, hmm, what's, what's wrong with me? And right. I think that's the question that is asked sometimes when you see high-achieving you know, black men right. who have... Why all don't they still yeah. think black women are worthy for them once exactly. they get to so that Exactly, so I think that, that kind of answers your question about why people get upset, even if you never have a chance to meet the guy. But why doesn't a high-achieving black woman look outside of her race? Like, why is it a we problem? Do. They do. <laughs> Trust me. <laughs> well, I, I want to I, I thank everyone uh, for coming. Uh, please give uh, my, my co-host and this panel a hand. Absolutely. Go ahead. Right, I want to, because I show love, I remember what it's like to be in college, and I stand behind my product. I'm going to give you all the college student discount for this book. It's, it's retail for $15. I'm going to give it to you for $14. No, I'm joking. I'm going to give it to you for free. Straight up free. It's at the back table. Back table. So y'all can, this is, so you can get your relationships right. I'm gifting this to you. First come, That's a first serve. You all, as college and aspiring college students, have a responsibility to transcend a lot of the drama and pathology that's suggested for you all to occupy. All right? Love can be very dramatic. It can be very fun and all those good things, but it can be sustaining, and it can extend beyond sex. Right? There is a loving, committed relationship that really is about community. And I attest to this on, on, on one end. My son is, is up here in the front row, and he is the product of a loving relationship that I had with my wife, who is a Spelman College alum, who I've been married to for eight years, and who I dated for 10 years prior to getting married, and who I did not cheat on while I was in graduate school in New York and while she was finishing her degree at Spelman College. 
and there are many other examples of that out there. So irrespective of the biology that we might talk about or the drama that we might talk about and that we might see in front of us on, on televised scripts or reality, there really is a personal experience that is your responsibility to occupy and to make sure that you take good care of yourself in terms of how you love people and how you allow yourselves to be loved. That's all I got to say. Have a great time this weekend. Peace. And I also want to say that tomorrow night on the Daily Drum at 7 o'clock, uh, Conjured Farrell will be.